everyone. Thank you for joining us today at our virtual reality naloxone training simulation webinar. As many of you know, we are thrilled to partner with Walmart to present this unique virtual reality training experience. We initially launched this simulation back in February 2020 at CACA's National Leadership Forum. We then engaged with many of our amazing coalitions to learn how our communities can host events using this technology. We had incredible feedback, including how to use this VR tool as a standalone awareness event, create a training around it, or add it to trainings that are already being held. To date, we've held almost 20 virtual screening events. We've engaged thousands of participants, and we look forward to hosting more events in the coming years and engaging thousands of new participants. This morning, we are thankful for you, our amazing CADCOM members and guests, and we are specifically thankful for our today's co-hosts, Lana Mahoney and the team at Recover Wyoming in Cheyenne. Before I kick this off to hear from our esteemed group of speakers, I wanna let everyone know the goals for today. We'll hear from a wonderful group of speakers here in Wyoming who are working every day to save lives. We are honored for them to be part of this event. We will then view a virtual reality simulation developed by Walmart that demonstrates a few different scenarios on how to recognize when an overdose is happening and how to administer naloxone. From these events, we plan to learn how to use this technology to better save lives and create a norm that every life is worth saving. Now I am pleased to introduce our first speaker, CACA's Chief of Staff, Valentino Murphy. Valentino joined our team last year and has been working ever since to help further CACA's mission of building and maintaining safe and healthy drug-free communities. We're thrilled to have him with us at CATCA, and we appreciate him being here today. Valentino? Thank you, Rako. As you stated, I am thrilled to be here for this very important event. I would like to personally thank Walmart for their investment in not only this technology, but for their investment in the people who will benefit from this training. I'd also like to extend a special thanks to our friends and supporters at Wyoming Department of Health and tonight's co-host, Recover Wyoming. It's an honor to be on with this such impressive leaders from the great state of Wyoming. Finally, I would like to thank everyone on today's webinar. We hope this unique event will train you on how local agencies are collaborating to combat opioid epidemic in our communities. CACA has a footprint in over 30 countries worldwide. We have more than 5,000 coalitions across the United States. We have sought to train community residents and leaders to build and develop coalitions in their communities and reduce substance misuse by adapting CACA's model for community change. CACA knows that the prevention of substance use and misuse before it starts is the most cost-effective and cost-efficient way to reduce our substance misuse. Prevention has become more important than ever. Recently, the CDC reported that over 109,000 drug overdose deaths occurred in the United States in the 12 months ending in March 2022. This is the largest number for a 12-month period ever recorded. To put it in perspective, that number is almost the size of the combined populations of Cheyenne and Casper. Sadly, it's estimated that that number would increase. This is tragic and we have to do our level best to right this ship. Together we are stronger. And as we train substance use and misuse pre prevention to co coalitions every day of the year, all across the world, we know that without the buy-in of our leaders and community stakeholders, such as yourselves, our desired end state will prove unachievable. You are the true heroes in our community. The conversation being had today on the webinar is not a unique one. Our partners at the Drug Enforcement Administration recently launched their One Pill Can Kill campaign, which aims to raise awareness about fentanyl-laced pills that are killing so many fellow Americans. Let it be known, if you do not receive your medication from your licensed pharmacist, do not take it. We have seen what One Pill Laced With Fentanyl can do and we do not need to see any more lives lost. 
keep up the great work that you are doing. I look forward to seeing you in, the, in person the next time we are all together. Thank you for having me on today. And back to you, Reiko. Thank you for those remarks, Valentino. We appreciate you joining us. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker. We're excited to introduce you to Haley Hayden. Haley joined on with the CDC Foundation earlier this year to carry out the Overdose Response Strategy Program as Wyoming's public health analyst. She'll tell us in just a few moments how the ORS is able to leverage several data points to create local interventions and responses to drug overdose. Previously, Haley worked under Wyoming's only mobile crisis team, where she spent a few years before transitioning over to the implementation of Wyoming's first law enforcement assisted diversion or LEAD program. She was part of the creation and execution of this project housed within the police and sheriff's department. Through her work, she was able to distribute naloxone to those in need, change the stigma around drug use and mental illness, reach important stakeholders, and decrease the repeating offense rate through the harm reduction program. She holds two master's degrees in psychology and criminology. We are excited to hear from you, Haley. Hi, my name is Haley Hayden, and I am the public health analyst for Wyoming for the ORS program. So the ORS program stands for Overdose Response Strategy Program. And it has evolved um, quite frequently over the years to adapt to what we are seeing across the United States in overdoses and um, the issues that we're seeing. So just to give you a little bit of history on what the ORS is exactly is, it is just a collaboration between public health and public safety partners. Um, it was created to help local communities reduce drug overdoses and save lives by being able to share data that is um, pertinent to intelligence and innovative strategies. So the main mission of the ORS program is to help reduce fatal and non-fatal drug overdoses um, by connecting public health and public safety agencies through sharing information and supporting evidence-based interventions. So what this looks like is um, a very heavy, intense, um, collaborative approach through public health and public safety sectors. Um, we're able to share the data that we're given and determine what next steps we need to hopefully alleviate some of our fatal and non-fatal overdoses and seeing where we're seeing huge gaps in our data and our responses and what we could do better as a community as a whole. We also use this information to help inform local communities um, to better develop solutions to reduce overdoses and save lives. And that's ultimately the, the main goal for the ORS program. So the ORS creates joint teams that can simultaneously promote public health and public safety efforts. And so what this means is that through the ORS, we have me, um, a public health analyst, and then we have a drug intelligence officer who work closely to collaborate on what we can do better. And since I'm more the public health side, we had to bring in someone who's more of the public safety side who can use that information better, utilize our systems better um, in ways that public health analysts cannot. So just to give you a little bit of a history of what a public health analyst is exactly, it is someone who um, looks at overdose reporting systems and tries to better increase interagency collaboration. We can get data, but if that data is not being used properly, then it really isn't something that is useful. And so my role is to use this data that we're seeing with overdoses and seeing how we can disseminate it throughout different agencies, especially through our communities. And so since I represent Wyoming, that spans the entire state and we have to make sure that every agency is getting that data that is useful for them and their community. One of the biggest goals as a public health analyst is to be able to facilitate rapid response strategies amongst our different stakeholders throughout our communities. 
if we see an overdose response, then it is up to us to be able to properly decide how we handle it and what our next steps are. So the other half of the ORS program is the drug intelligence officer. So my drug intelligence officer, Casey Patterson, he's someone who I utilize a lot for um, data within the HIDA, which is the high intensity drug trafficking area um, factor. And we look at what data they're presenting throughout our region and how we can better utilize that data to, to work within our state. And so he really helps um, look at drug trafficking trends and better understand it for our communities. And he also deals with local residents um, when they're arrested on felony drug charges in other parts of the state or country. And so he plays a huge role in that reporting system for drug trafficking areas. So something that we utilize as a collaborative approach is OD map, which we take the reports of drug overdoses in our state, and we see if there are multiple overdoses um, in that area. And so with this, we're able to see if there's a trend, if there's something that um, needs to be responded to better, or if we can properly send out a team to go respond to overdoses or what else there needs to be done. When we see that there's a large number of people who are overdosing in a certain area, then we kind of notice that there might be what we call a spike alert. And so through these spike alerts, it's really important to utilize our resources and see what else that we can do to properly make sure that there's not more going on behind the scenes. So that is pretty much the overview of what the ORS stands for and my role and the drug intelligence officer's role within our state of Wyoming. And it's really important that we're continuing to expand our resources for um, non-fatal and fatal overdoses and seeing what else that we can do as a state as a whole. And so something I always love with this job is that we really do collaborate with anyone and everyone. And a lot of people will come to us and say, hey, what are we doing about this? Or what else can we do about that? And it really does take a huge effort throughout everyone within the state of Wyoming to make sure that we're doing what we need to do to better equip ourselves with resources um, so that we're preventing overdoses. It really is a team effort and we're utilizing everyone that we can. Thank you. Thank you, Haley, for your enthusiasm for new and innovative partnerships. It's impressive to see how you're leading change by consistently working to bridge gaps in services. We appreciate you. Next, we will hear from Sergeant Ryan Martinez. Sergeant Martinez currently serves as the Administrative Training Sergeant at the Laramie County Sheriff's Department. He's been with the department for almost 18 years. Prior to holding his current position, he served as patrol deputy, a detective, a patrol sergeant. Sergeant Martinez is responsible for a range of many different programs as the administrative sergeant, including the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion or LEAD program, which we will hear more about now. Sergeant Martinez. Hi, uh, my name is Ryan Martinez. I'm currently the Administrative Training Sergeant at the Laramie County Sheriff's Department in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Um, a little bit of background myself, I've been with the department for almost 18 years now. I've been in law enforcement for in total about 21 years now. <clears throat> Substance abuse, addiction, mental health is and has been a problem for us uh, similar to the rest of the country. And so we have recently started a lead program in our community to try and combat some of these issues. Um, lead is lead stands for law enforcement diversion program. And the lead program that Cheyenne um, and Laramie County started in September of 2020 is the first of its kind. It's the first lead program in the state of Wyoming. And in fact, it's the only one in the Rocky Mountain region north of Colorado. And we have several community partners um, in the LEAD program. Uh, Laramie County, um, 
government as well as the sheriff's department um, to go along with the Cheyenne Regional Medical Center, uh, the Volunteers of America, the city of Cheyenne, along with the Cheyenne Police Department and uh, Community Action of Laramie County are all community partners in the program along with us. So a little bit about the LEAD program. It aims to reduce criminal recidivism by diverting low level offenders from prosecution in the criminal justice system to harm uh, reduction based case management services. The LEAD program is a voluntary program for participants. They can be referred to the program uh, a couple different ways, one of which is by law enforcement uh, in lieu of low level charges, um, or they can be referred to the, the program by what we call as a social contact referral, which means at the, at the time of contact with, uh, at the time of their contact with law enforcement, they're not necessarily committing a crime, but the, the law enforcement officer perceives them as a high risk for a future arrest based upon um, low level drug activity. Our, our operational work group, which uh, is made up of our community partners, has established some criteria for participants to be eligible for the program. And once they're referred, participants are, are screened to make sure they meet this, this criteria before receiving LEAD resources. One thing that's very unique about the LEAD program is there is no uh, set time limit for how long participants can be in the program. Receipt uh, of ongoing services is conditional on the participant making good use of the resources and making progress towards reducing the, the harm that their behavior, that their uh, be, you know, previous behavior has brought upon themselves or the community. There's many allowable costs that, that, that the LEAD pro program can, can cover, but some of the main ones um, for our participants are transportation, mental health, substance abuse services and treatments, medical supplies, food, clothing, um, shoes, uh, those types of basic needs, um, lodging, temporary lot lodging, as well as even somewhat longer term lodging, uh, moving costs associated with that sometimes, and eviction and costs with eviction prevention under circum certain circumstances sometimes. The vast majority of our participants that are in the LEAD program struggle with substance abuse um, issues, particularly synthetic uh, opiate, opiates such as fentanyl and similar, similar drugs. Uh, due to the substance abuse issues and addiction, many of our participants continue to use even, even during their participation in the LEAD program. Um, through our partnership with HealthWorks here in Laramie County, we participants can obtain a free dose of Narcan um, in hopes of trying to prevent uh, any sort of opiate over overdoses in the future. I'm gonna go over a, a few success stories uh, that we've had in the, our LEAD program with participants and, and clients. And I'm not gonna, I won't use the participants' names. Um, I'll, I'll just refer, I'll refer to this subject as subject A. Uh, they had a, between 10 to 15 interactions with law enforcement this year uh, that were calls for service related to the effects of their, their drug use, fentanyl, methamphetamine, cocaine, Xanax. Um, this subject expressed interest in applying for a residential treatment program for their substance abuse issues. And, and after a month long application process, our lead staff were able to assist in coordinating their acceptance to a residential treatment facility out of state. And they're currently going on two months in that treatment facility. Um, subject B was incarcerated twice this year due to possession of controlled substance charges. On their second arrest, they were accepted into the drug court program. Um, however, two months after being in the program, the subject was rearrested for violating conditions of the program. The subject was facing prison time and was given one last opportunity to make a, a change in their, their life. Through agency collaboration between the drug court staff 
and our lead program staff. This subject was accepted into a six month treatment facility and has been, and has been in that uh, facility since September of 2022. Our third subject has been in our program since June of 2022, was experiencing homelessness due to a suspension of workers compensation benefits and a, de not, and a denial of disability benefits that led to a cascade of events resulting in incarcerations for public intoxication and, and being assaulted. Through the assistance of our program, we were able to get them in temporary housing, connect them with a, a physician through HealthWorks, and we also connected them with an attorney to assist in appealing their disability case and with Meals on Wheels for food. And so those, those are three of the, what we like to call uh, success stories for our, our lead participants. Um, but that's, um, but that's only three of the, the participants we have in the, in the program in total. Thank you, Sergeant Martinez, for speaking to us today and for your tremendous work in Laramie. It's so impressive to hear how small changes and individual attention can create changes that are invaluable for people struggling with substance use disorder and sensible for the wider community. Next up, we'll be joined by Erica Matthews. Erica is the Grants and Programs Unit Manager for the Wyoming Department of Health Behavioral Health Division. Previously, she served as a Substance Abuse and Suicide Prevention Program Manager. She's passionate about bringing mental health and substance awareness and assistance to Wyoming communities. In her spare time, she enjoys embracing the wonderful activities Wyoming's Outdoors provides. Here now is Erica. This is Erica Matthews with the Wyoming Department of Health. We just like to let you know that free naloxone is available for agencies, businesses, and organizations in Wyoming. Naloxone is a potentially life-saving prescription medication designed to help reverse the effects of opioid overdose. The active ingredient in naloxone can quickly reverse an overdose by blocking the effects of opioids and restore normal breathing within two to three minutes in a person whose breath has slowed or even stopped as a result of opioid overdose. More than one dose of naloxone may be required when stronger opioids like fentanyl are involved. This naloxone program provides free naloxone to agencies, businesses, and organizations in Wyoming that may be in a position to help individuals experience an opioid, experiencing an opioid overdose. Approved orders will be shipped directly to you. Since 2018, 93 non-medical-based uses of naloxone have been reported to the Wyoming Department of Health. For more information, please visit the Wyoming Department of Health website at the location below. Thank you, Erica, for your introdu introduction to naloxone and for everything you do to ensure it's accessible to the people who need it. Our next speaker is Ashley McRae. Ashley is the Community Prevention Specialist for Campbell County. She works closely with community stakeholders and volunteers to implement evidence-based programs for substance use and suicide prevention strategies. We're always fortunate to have such dedicated members at CACA who are leading campaigns such as When the Game Slows Down that are making a real measured impact for the youth in our communities. We look forward to hearing more about your strategies and impact, Ashley. I'm Ashley McRae, and I am the Community Prevention Specialist for Campbell County, and I work for Campbell County Public Health. Um, some of the initiatives that we are doing to address opioid prevention here, we have partnered with the pharmacies and physicians who write prescriptions um, to give out our med lock boxes and the Tetera safe disposal kits when an opioid prescription is written. And those either go to the person who received the prescription or if they have a power of attorney or somebody who's in charge of their health care, then they get those to monitor. Um, one of the biggest barriers we have seen is support for youth after an injury who become addicted to opioids. Um, they really don't know what they're doing. It's a new substance into their body and they, they may like the way it feels. Um, we started doing some research on it and the National Athletic Training Association indicated that 90% of student athletes 
reported sustaining some sort of sports related injury and 54% of them were while they were playing and they continued to play. So we partnered with the Campbell County School District and Salvestry Customization to promote when the game slows down. And it provides education targeted for youth about use and safe usage, safe disposal. Um, there's a series of videos that go out and the schools have big posters in the gym when a youth gets hurt at a sporting event, the parents get this little packet that has information about opioids, as well as a lockbox and the deterrent kits. The When the Game Slows Down program in our junior high and high schools, based on the PNA data, we have seen an increase in perception of harm by taking prescriptions that aren't yours or misusing them. So in 2018, when the first survey was initiated, the perception of harm was 56.5%. So 56.5% of 6th, 8th, 10th, and 12th graders in Campbell County didn't view taking prescription pills or misusing them was a risk. In 2020, when the survey was readministered to 6th, 8th, 10th, and 12th graders, that perception of harm went to 86.9% um, viewing that it's a it, risk to take prescription built pills that aren't yours or misuse them. Um, throughout the community, we have worked with families who have a loved one um, that suffers from addiction and provided safe um, disposal kits, lock boxes, and gave the instructions for setting up the code to get into them to the caretaker. Um, we work with veterans to keep them safe from misusing or abusing their prescription pills as well. Uh, thank you guys for listening, and I hope you took something away. If you need any resources, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you, Ashley. It's so inspiring to hear about the impact you're having in your community. And we're honored to be able to share more about your public service announcements and campaigns here today. It's now my pleasure to introduce our co-host and our final speaker for today, Lana Mahoney. Lana Mahoney is a person in long-term recovery and certified peer specialist with mastery and forensic endorsements. Her background is in behavioral health and recovery support services. She began her journey with Recover Wyoming in 2011 as a volunteer and has since worked for the organization in various roles, including administrative assistant, Laramie County Veterans Treatment Court Coordinator, a case manager for Projects for Assistance in Transition from Homeless, or PATH, Peer Specialist Training Coordinator, and her current role as Executive Director. She has been instrumental in furthering the peer specialist profession in the state. Lana holds an Associate of Arts degree in Education from Laramie County Community College and a Bachelor of Arts degree in Psychology from the University of Wyoming. She recently completed a master's certification in nonprofit administration from Colorado State University. Lana is passionate about providing hope and helping others find their path to recovery. She values the important partnerships with individuals and organizations in the community who share her mission to help others achieve recovery and holistic wellness. Lana, we're so excited for your message. Hi there, my name is Lana Mahoney and I am a woman in long-term recovery from stimulant use disorder, which for me means that I ended my chaotic relationship with substances on October 22nd, 2011. I am a certified peer specialist with forensic and mastery endorsements. And I am currently the executive director of Recover Wyoming here in Cheyenne. Recover Wyoming is a recovery community organization and nonprofit. We're actually, um, we're one of over 175 RCOs in the United States. We do many things, but our, our main focus is to help people get into long-term recovery from substance use disorder. And um, our organization is peer run, which means that all of our staff and the majority of our board of directors are in long-term recovery. 
our um, personal lived experience helps drive our programs and services. So um, kind of our core services are that we provide uh, peer-based recovery support through our recovery coach and telephone recovery support programs. We also provide all recovery meetings to people seeking recovery here at the recovery center. Um, one of the things that Recover Wyoming does is that we honor all pathways to recovery. And what that means for us is that we recognize that people attain wellness and recovery through many different ways. And one of those pathways is through harm reduction strategies. Um, that's something that we really advocate for. Frankly, what we're seeing, uh, what many folks are seeing is that, you know, people are dying from this disease. We're seeing a lot of um, overdose deaths. And so harm reduction strategies are very important to us because we just want to implement whatever we can to help save lives. One of the things that we've started utilizing here at the Recovery Center is our harm reduction supplies basket. And so um, what, what we have in that basket are things like naloxone, fentanyl testing strips, um, condoms, wound care supplies, such as Band-Aids and antibiotic ointment, hand sanitizer, masks, things like that. Uh, we provide the harm reduction basket just in the front entryway of the recovery center. And so we encourage people just to come in, take whatever they need, no questions asked. And so uh, our thought is that if people come in and they, they recognize that we have these supplies, maybe they come into the center a few times and, you know, maybe one time they come in and they say, hey, I'd like to learn more about what you do, or I'd like to talk about recovery. You know, that's kind of what we're here for. I think the idea is that we show people that we love and care about them and that we're providing them with opportunities um, to stay safe while they're using. And this helps to, um, you know, reduce stigma and allow people to say, you know, hey, you know, I'd like to talk about recovery and maybe not have that fear that someone is um, judging them related to their substance use disorder. I know that harm reduction strategies are very important. Uh, for myself, as, as a person in recovery, for many years, I struggled with substance use disorder, and I never sought out any help. I was really afraid of, you know, what people might think, and I didn't want that stigma associated with um, my use. And so I was really afraid to reach out to anyone, and I think that that's the case for a lot of folks. I, I think that by providing opportunities uh, for harm reduction that we're really just showing people that we care about them and that it opens the door for future discussions on you know, learning about recovery or learning about potential pathways to recovery. One of the things that um, has been nice about having naloxone on staff, uh, first of all, all of our staff members are trained on how to use Narcan and naloxone. Uh, so you know, should someone come in, who is potentially experiencing an overdose, we are aware of how to administer that. It's also nice, um, I know just recently I had a couple family members come in, they had a loved one who is struggling with substance use and they were concerned about the potential of, of overdose. And so we were able to send them off with a couple of doses of naloxone so that should they need to use it, that they had it on hand. And I think that also, um, you know, really provides family members with some tools to help support their loved ones. And again, it's an opportunity to say that, you know, hey, I care about you. Um, you know, I want you to be safe. I want you to be alive. And so, um, you know, we're just going to continue to provide that to the community. One thing that we're trying to do is just really share with our community partners what we're doing related to harm reduction, you know, help continue the conversation about harm reduction strategies, um, help to destigmatize substance use disorder, and really the end goal is just to help save lives. So whatever we can do to advocate for that, um, that's what Recover Wyoming will do. And we're glad to support any other efforts that people have going related to harm reduction or helping people find long-term recovery. Thank you, Lana, for being our co-hosts and helping this event be so successful and for all you do to open doors and support others in Cheyenne. Thank you to all of our speakers. Each one of you are doing so much to raise awareness and expand services in this challenging environment. And now we will view the virtual reality simulation portion of this event. 
Walmart has invested in training their associates, which includes the use of virtual reality. The virtual reality program was developed as a tool for training to build skills in unique training situations that are hard to replicate in the classroom setting, such as Black Friday trainings and simulations. This technology led to the development of non-retail training, such as the VR, which we will see next. Let's take a moment to view this training. That's what I just wiped for my grandma. What? <laughs> Don't people get strung out on this stuff? Yeah. That's the point. These two industrious young gentlemen have stolen opioid medication for recreational use. Oxycodone, hydrocodone, fentanyl, and heroin are a group of chemicals referred to as opioids. The first three may be prescribed by a medical professional to treat pain, but they can be addictive and deadly, especially if not taken as directed. Heroin has no legitimate medical purpose. Opioid overdose is the current leading cause of death for people under 55. True or false? More than half of Americans have been affected by opioids. Correct. Over 70,000 people died of opioid overdose in the United States in 2017. And millions more were impacted through overdose or misuse. That means that if you have not been directly affected by opioids, someone you know likely has. But not every overdose needs to end in death. Today we're going to teach you to spot the signs of an overdose and administer naloxone, a life-saving medication. Hey, you okay, dude? You don't look so good. Hey. Opioid overdoses will slow or stop your breathing. This reduces the amount of oxygen in your body, resulting in pale or clammy skin. The pupils will constrict until they are the size of a pin. The lack of oxygen can cause the fingers and sometimes lips to turn blue, gray, or purple, depending on the person's skin tone. The breathing is weird, it's too slow. A very serious side effect of opioids is depressed breathing. During an overdose, their breathing will become shallow, erratic, or stop entirely. Yo, Jay. Jay. Jay, Jay. Wake up, man. Wake up or I'm calling the cops. John. Hey, I'm not playing with you. Are you breathing? Dude, you're not breathing. Jonathan. Loss of consciousness is the final tell of an overdose. If you suspect someone is passing out because of an overdose, 
you should scream their name and try to wake them to see if they will respond. As with any emergency, the first thing you should do is call 911. 911, what's the emergency? Yeah, hello. Um, yeah, my, I need help. Naloxone is a life-saving medication that can reverse opioid overdose and restore breathing. There are several types of naloxone available, and all of them provide a life-saving medication in the event of an opioid overdose. In the example today, you will see the nasal spray Narcan administered. If you happen to have the injectable form, make sure to hold the needle straight and inject it into a muscle, like the shoulder or the upper thigh. First, peel back the packaging to remove the device. The device has a plunger and a nozzle. Hold the device with your thumb on the plunger and two fingers on the nozzle. Be careful not to accidentally spray the naloxone before you are ready. The device only has one dose, so don't test it out. Put the device right up their nostril until your fingers are touching their nose. Press firmly on the plunger to release the dose of naloxone. Come on, buddy. Wake up. Come on, man, wake up. After you administer naloxone, place them in the recovery position and wait for help. The person who overdosed needs immediate medical care. You should stay with them until help arrives in case they lose consciousness again. Another dose may be necessary. There you go. There you go. All right, that's it. Welcome back. Great job. When people think of overdose, they usually think of recreational opioid use like we saw here. This is a stereotype. And unfortunately, there are many situations that lead to accidental overdose. Let's take a look at other situations that can lead to accidental overdose. Mom? 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 Mom, wake up. Mom? Again. My mother is blacked out. Uh, I think she's had a heart attack. Send an ambulance. Please stay calm. I'm going to check her vitals. What's her name? Blanche. Blanche, I'm here to help you, okay? Is that hers? I'm gonna check her for an overdose. She's got a pulse, but her breathing is slow. Let's check her pupils. All right, stay with me. Uh-oh, they're constricted. With this medication, this may be an overdose. Let's administer naloxone. All right, Blanche, stick with me, okay? One second. All right, I'm just gonna go right up here. The patient took too much of her prescribed medication. She forgot that she took her medication before breakfast and took another dose after breakfast. In the event that this had been a heart attack, Naloxone wouldn't have been able to treat the heart attack, but it would generally be fine to administer it to her without serious complications. Talk to your healthcare provider or check the package insert for possible side effects and additional information. Eugene, got your stuff. Oh no. (sighs) 
Eugene took an old opioid medication that he had previously been prescribed for pain. Usually this wouldn't cause an overdose, but he's taking a new benzodiazepine medication. When opioids and benzodiazepines mix, the results can be deadly. Always check with your doctor or pharmacist before taking any medication, just in case there will be a negative interaction with your other medications. Opioid overdose can happen to anyone. You can overdose from opioids even when taking a prescription exactly as your doctor prescribed, which is exactly what happened to me. All right, hotshot. I hope you're paying attention. It's your time to shine. Select the things you should look for when you suspect an opioid overdose. Now, let's review how to administer naloxone. Correct. You have to remove the device from its packaging. It will not do you a lot of good otherwise. Correct. That's how you hold the device. That's correct. You did it. You saved my life. Thank you for knowing what to do in the event of an opioid overdose. Accidental overdose can happen to anyone taking opioids, whether recreationally or even as directed by a doctor. This information can save a life. Opioid misuse is a national epidemic and accidental overdose can happen to anyone taking opioids. It takes an entire community to keep all our members safe from overdose. If you or someone you care about is taking opioids for any reason, consider getting naloxone at your local pharmacy and keeping it on you at all times. No prescription is required and it could save your life or the life of someone you care about. Thank you to the Walmart team for developing this powerful tool. We're so excited to work with you to connect this to community members. And again, thank you to all of the speakers here today who have taken time to be part of this event. We wanna extend our thanks to all of our speakers and participants for attending this event. We truly appreciate your time. Please reach out to us at CADCA anytime with any suggestions or questions. My name is Rachel Mendoza, and you can reach me or any member of our team at rmendoza at CADCA.org. And look for us to be reaching out to you to discuss this more and get your tremendous feedback. And finally, thank you so much to our friends at Recover Wyoming, our co-hosts today and wonderful friends. We have added their websites to the chat box. Please visit them and learn more about the amazing work they're doing in Wyoming. We are now through the hour and we will conclude the webinar. Thank you all for coming and I wish you a wonderful rest of the week.